So what does it mean to be human, anyway? After a decade as a humanities researcher, I thought I knew the answer to that question. But then I encountered some stories that made me really start to wonder. The heroes of these stories aren't humans like you and me, though. They're animals. So maybe we could call them fables. Of course, fables have morals, little lessons you learn that help you be a better I'm not sure if I learned something from these fables, though. It's more like I unlearned something. I unlearned what it meant to be human. So here are my fables for a less human, more lively world. This is a shark. In 2011, a great white shark in Australia attacked and killed a spearfisher. The government ordered police to track down and kill any shark they could find without even trying to track down the guilty shark. This is often the case when wild animals attack. We've killed mountain lions, mama grizzly bears, uh, endangered alligators, and we do the same with domestic animals like dogs who turn on their owners. Justice, when it comes for animals, is swift, deadly, and administered without a trial. Moral. The legal system is for humans, not animals. This is a pig. One day in the 1300s, a pig in a medieval village ate a communion wafer. The pig was executed for blasphemy. But before that happened, the pig was given a full criminal trial, complete with a judge, a defense attorney, everything. In medieval courts, confessions were only accepted if they were administered under torture. They thought that if you were in pain, you wouldn't be able to lie. So the pig was put on the rack, tortured, and had his confession used against him in court. They even hired a professional human executioner to perform a professional human execution on the pig. But this wasn't the only pig that was put on trial. We were trying pigs all the way up into the 1800s. We tried other domestic animals as well, like oxen and horses. We even tried flocks of weevils that destroyed crops or rats that ate stored grain. I stumbled upon this history of animal trials when I was researching the history of pets, and I was pretty surprised. Were these people crazy? Or was the whole thing some sort of barbaric excuse used to justify their desire to take revenge on these bad animals? I didn't know, but I was left with this moral. The legal system once was for humans and animals. This is a donkey. As I worked my way through this extensive archive of animal trials, one case really stood out to me. In 1750, a man and a donkey were put on trial as co-defendants in a case of bestiality. The donkey's lawyers called character witnesses who described her as honest and testified to her being well-behaved. The judge believed them and concluded that the donkey must have been forced to participate in the act against her will. The donkey was acquitted. The man executed. So that's when I really started thinking. After all, this donkey received a perfectly fair trial, one that hinged on the court's belief that her character determined her actions. The judge must have thought of her as just as capable of free will, knowing right from wrong, and making moral choices as a human would have been. Otherwise, he just would have executed her the same way we do now. This wasn't barbarism. This was some other way of seeing animals, not as the equals of humans, but not as our opposites either. Moral. Something has changed in the way we think about the relationship between humans and animals. This is a chicken, and this is a dog. Once upon a time, in medieval villages, we lived close up to our animals. We were in the same room as them, close enough to see those flashes of character traits we now think of as uniquely human. Things like personality, emotion, memory, intelligence, even consciousness. But then, industrialization moved humans out of villages and into cities. At this increased distance from animals, we started to see them as food, something to consume for our physical needs, or as pets, something to consume for our emotional needs. 
In the first case, they became commodities, interchangeable raw materials to exploit at will. In the second, fetishes, impossibly valuable treasures. But in both cases, animals became things. Modernization took humans out of the world. It put us at a distance and allowed us to operate on it objectively through the lens of a rifle or the sight of a camera, or even, let's say, the sight of a camera or the lens of a rifle, because I'm never going to get that line correct. Um, but from this remove, we're able to view ourselves as masters of the world, capable of dominating it at will. That position allows us to imagine that we humans have some special innate trait that separates us from the things around us. And whenever we want to prove it, we can simply objectify the world again. Making animals into things was just one part of a larger process of making us into humans. Moral, there's something inhumane in this process of becoming human. This is an emu. Australia once declared war on emus. They were rampaging through the outback, terrorizing farms and destroying crops. The army mobilized a whole battalion against them, but the emus easily outran jeeps and evaded machine gun fire. After wasting thousands of dollars on ammunition, the army was forced to retreat. The government then tried something different. They took that money and they gave it to the farmers who actually lived with the emus. The military had viewed the birds as things, targets in a shooting gallery. But the farmers knew the emus as something more, something capable of tactics and creativity. By empowering the farmers to deal with the emus, the government brought the problem quickly to a hold. And so this got me thinking about what are trials really for? I think that they're not about strife and conflict. I think that they're about community and togetherness. After all, if I sue you for having a dangerous open pit in your yard, the fact that I meet you in court means that I acknowledge us as both belonging to some sort of shared society. And the fact that we meet in court, not as opposites, but as something like opposed equals, gives us a space to work through our differences and reconstruct that society. So what happens when conflict arises with an enemy you don't recognize as equal? It's war. The Emu War, I think, demonstrates the problem of viewing animals as things. It prevents us from finding sophisticated solutions to animal problems. And animal problems are just going to get worse as populations move across the globe, as climates change, and as technology brings us in more and more rapid contact with the animals in our world, those problems are going to get more and more complex. Moral, the world is becoming an impossibly complicated place, and thinking of animals as things prevents us of finding creative ways of dealing with that. This is a monkey. Uh, well, it's a macaque, but don't worry about that. Um, and unlike the other pictures I've shown you, uh, this guy actually took this picture himself. A photographer passed his digital camera to him and the monkey took this selfie and triggered waves of lawsuits. First, after the image went viral on the internet, the photographer found that he didn't have any copyright control over the image. After all, if only humans can think, then only humans have the right to intellectual property. So far, so bad, the same humans are the only subjects of justice, but things do get worse. After the photographer published the image, which he believed to be in the public domain, in a book, he was sued by the monkey. The, the case was settled out of court, but the photographer ended up having to cede part of the proceeds from the book, and thus part of the authorship over the image to the monkey. Maybe animal trials are coming back. A few years ago in Kazakhstan, a bear was let out of jail on parole after serving a lengthy sentence for mauling some people. But I think these new animal trials highlight the innate flexibility and capacity for adaptation that's at the heart of our legal system. After all, that's why we allow appeals and why we try criminals rather than sentencing them de facto. 
case law is constantly redefining the boundaries of the law, something we imagine as fixed and permanent as that line separating humans from animals. Moral. Our systems were set up to challenge boundaries, not to maintain them. And that's why we can use them to imagine more just worlds. This is a toaster. So just a thing, no animal, right? OK, imagine waking up in the smart home of tomorrow. You go downstairs to the kitchen to discover that your toaster has talked to your refrigerator and they've changed the brand of frozen waffles they order for you because they're concerned about your health. You'll be surrounded by devices, everything from thermostats to light switches, really everything, that are constantly adapting their behavior in response to you and the other devices in your house. Won't you start to notice flashes of personality, emotion, even defiance in these things? That smart home of tomorrow looks a lot to me like the medieval village house of the past where humans are living in the same room as oxen and pigs. Technology is bringing the world back to life. And just as it's enabling humans to do more and more spectacular things, it's enabling new forms of animal intelligence and creativity as well. We just saw a monkey win a copyright settlement just by learning how to use a digital camera. But octopuses in aquariums are developing spectacular new problem-solving techniques just through being exposed to ubiquitous everyday technologies. As this technological growth accelerates, will we find it increasingly complicated and difficult to tell the difference between humans, animals, and things? Because that's really what's on trial here. Our conviction that humans are human and animals are animals and things are things. Moral, we need to unlearn this lesson quickly. The world is becoming more complex, more interconnected, and more bizarre by the day. And our old preconceptions won't help us deal with that. We need to dream up new ways of being human that don't rely on objectifying the world around us. And only then can we start to imagine new ways of living on this busy, constantly evolving planet. Thank you. <laughs>